Good evening, and welcome to the 85th Annual Meeting of People's Energy Cooperative. My name is Gwen Stevens, and I'm the Director of Cooperative Relations. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us online. We are really hoping this is the last time we have to have a virtual only annual meeting and that we can all gather again next year. Before we begin, let's cover how you can ask a question as well as cover one announcement. On both YouTube and Facebook, you can ask a question in the comment section. We have staff monitoring both sites and they will collect all the questions. We will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the one hour meeting. The 81st annual meeting of Daryl and Power Cooperative is on Wednesday, June 8th at the La Crosse Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin. If you would like to join us as a delegate, you must be registered. To register and reserve a seat on the chartered bus from Peoples, please email memberrelations at peoplesenergy.coop or call the cooperative at 1-800-214-2694 to express your interest. We will provide you with more details when you connect with us. Dareland is also offering a virtual option this year. Voting delegates must attend in person, but if you would simply like to watch the meeting online, please contact us so you can be provided information on how to do that. You must be a cooperative member to participate either in person or online. At this time, I will introduce your board of directors who are present in the conference center this evening. Also in the room are the board candidates who will be introduced later. However, uh, candidate Randy Brock was unable to join us this evening because he teaches a class at RCTC, so he sends his regards. The cooperative board consists of seven members, one from each district who are elected at large by the members. They are from District 1, Joe Book, District 2, Jody Twite, District 3, Bob Hafes, District 4, Tracy Lauritsen, who is our Secretary Treasurer, Board Chair Jerry Wooners from District 5, District 6 is represented by Art Frederick, who's also the Vice Chair and also our Darylin Director. Director 6 is represented by Jeff Orth. These are your Board of Directors. Secretary and Treasurer Tracy, Tracy Lauritsen will now lead us in an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. For those of you in the room, please stand if you are able. Heavenly Father, over 85 years ago, a group of people came together to bring electricity to their homes in rural Southeast Minnesota. You guided their work, rooting it in the seven cooperative principles. Because of this, we can look back at decades of our history in gratitude. We continue to be reminded of how good things happen when people come together for sustainable development of their communities. Guide us and encourage us to live true to our founding principles as our industry looks to the future. We give thanks to our dedicated employees and their commitment to our mission of providing reliable electric service and for their willingness to innovate and adapt as the workplace and our industry changes. We are also thankful for every day they go home safely to their families. Continue to protect and inspire them as they work in service to our members and each other. As we move forward amidst a changing energy landscape, we are reminded that you were there in the beginning, just as you are here now. <clears throat> continue to protect, guide, and inspire us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please now join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. At this time, Board Chair Jerry Wooner will officially open the meeting. Mr. Wooner? Good evening and welcome. I have been informed that the number of members who have voted is sufficient to constitute a quorum of the election and bylaw amendment vote. Therefore, I officially call this meeting to order. On the screen, you will see the agenda for this evening's meeting. 
I call for a motion and a sec second to accept the meeting agenda. Got a, mo got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries, thank you. Tracy will now give the secretary's report and request approval for the 2021 annual meeting minutes. <clears throat> All members were mailed a notice of the annual meeting in the annual report, which was mailed earlier this month. Notice was also given in the director ballot mailing the first week of March. The minutes of last year's annual meeting were published on page seven of the annual report. Unless there are op op objections or corrections, I ask the chair to consider a motion to approve these minutes as published and to dispense with reading them. Mr. Chair? Unless there are any objections, I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes as published and to dispense of the reading of them. So moved. Got a motion, need a second? Second. Got a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. Tracy will now present the financial report. <clears throat> As treasurer of People's Energy Cooperative, it is my responsibility to report to you the financial condition of the cooperative. The cooperative's financial statements are on pages 10 and 11 of the annual report, and we received a clean audit report with no adjustments from the accounting firm of Brady, Matz, and Associates. My report today covers calendar year 2021 and provides yearly comparisons back to 2014. As most of you may recall, we acquired approximately 7,000 members and the physical assets from Alliant Energy in 2015. As I review the financial information, you will see the positive effects of this acquisition. In 2021, uh, was the sixth year of our operation since this acquisition. <clears throat> Total services in place as of December 31st, 2021 were 23,878, which is an increase of 239 services or a 1% increase since 2020. In the prior five years, total services have increased 1.9%. Over the past five years, our kilowatt hour sales have increased one half percent. This is a common trend in our industry where membership growth does not directly correlate with energy sales. Efficiencies in appliances, distributed generation, and load control programs result in less kilowatt sales year after year. This can result in additional pressure on rates and highlights the importance of growth to help mitigate that pressure. The cooperative's total assets were $177.5 million at the end of the year. This is compared to $172.7 million in 2020. This is an increase of 2.8% over the previous year and is due primarily to the construction needed to rebuild aging power lines. The average life of our assets is 30 years. To maintain reliability, we should re, uh, replace around 3% of our system annually. Total member equity was $60.9 million, which is just over 34% of our total assets. The equity ratio is important to us, as it is used by lenders to measure our credit worthiness, your board of directors has set a goal to increase equity in the next three years. I am pleased to report the cooperative just uh, returned just over $1.1 million of capital credits in cash to members during the year. Capital credits are member equity or ownership in our cooperative and represents a fundamental difference that sets cooperatives apart from other utility business models. 
Operating revenue was $50.5 million compared to $49.7 million in 2020. The cost of purchase power increased 1.4% compared to 2020. Purchase power is our largest expense and represents about 56 cents of every dollar we take in. The overall cost of purchase power in cents per kilowatt hours was 7.45 cents in 2021. This was up slightly from 2020 when it was 7.41 cents. 2021 and 2020 were down from 2019 when it was 7.58 cents. Darlin Power Cooperative, our primary power provider, is predicting relatively flat cost of power charges in the near term. Excluding the cost of purchase power, total expenses decreased by $314,000, or 1.5% since 2020. We saw a reduction in expenses related to COVID-19 regulations, which involved less travel and meeting expenses. The area we saw the most reduction was in the operation and maintenance of our lines. The expenses were down slightly due to low number of outages. We've seen the positive results of reliability due to our vegetation management and maintenance programs. We have included inflation rates in this graph. As you can see and have experienced, 2021 saw the largest increase in over 30 years. We have planned for these pressures in the future budgets and forecasts, and we incorporated those increased expenses without adding additional revenue uh, through rates. With past investments in technology and efficiencies gained in our workflow processes, we have been able to hold our controlled expenses relatively flat over the past years. Interest on long-term debt decreased $89,000 in 2021. This was due to prepayments of long-term debt in the past in a favorable in interest rate environment. During 2021, we also mitigated the level of debt that we borrowed to fund our construction work plan. We borrowed nearly $5 million less than we had needed in the prior years. This is one strategy we are using to assist with growing our equity. Your cooperative has a solid financial year with total margins of $3.6 million. Keep in mind these margins will be paid out to members in the future years based on the rotation of capital credits and the board of directors approves annually. It is necessary that we generate margins annually to assist with the cash flow that is needed to fund our construction work plan and our debt service agreements. We also have loan covenants that requires us to generate enough margins to cover our interest expense obligations for the current year. As many of you are aware, we have completed cost of service studies annually to assist with our rate alignment and to ensure we are collecting fixed costs through the basic service charge. In review of that analysis at the end of 2021, we looked at our retail rates all the way back to 2012. In 2012, the all-in revenue cents per kilowatt hour was 13.65 cents. This represents the average overall cost per kilowatt hour each member pays for their power bill, which includes all components, including basic service charge, energy charges, and demand charges. From 2015 to 2018, we saw a decrease to as low as 13.404 cents. This was due to a rate freeze imposed by the uh, Public Utility Commission as a stipulation of the Alliant acquisition. From 2018 to 2020, rates were adjusted based off the cost of service study. And at the end of 2021, all rates except a few were at the recommended rate base on the study. 
As you can see, from 2012 to 2021, rates increased, 13, increased to 13.99 cents from 13.65 cents. In the span of 10 years, that results in a 2.5% increase, or one quarter of a percent annually. During that time frame, inflation grew by 16.8%. As you can see, our cooperative is in sound financial condition. Mr. Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you, Tracy, for the financial report. For more than a decade, your cooperative has engaged in a formal st strategic planning process about every three years. St strategic planning is important because it provides direction and measurable goals to help us deliver, deliver on our mission to bring value to our member co owners and communities by providing reliable electricity, superior customer service, and innovative energy solutions at fair and reasonable prices. It also helps us achieve our vision of being a trusted energy resource for our members, an employer of choice, and a respected business partner with our communities. In 2021, the board of directors and executive staff worked with the consultant to formulate a new three-year strategic plan. This process include includes some form of SWOT analysis that considers the cooperative strengths, its weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It essentially helps us take an inventory of where we are and forces us to think about where we want to be in three years and beyond. Then we determine what we need to do to get there. During the last year's process, we sought out input from two key stakeholder groups our employee group, and the member advisory committee on behalf of the membership. We felt it was important to get more perspectives than just those board of the board and the executive staff. In the end, we landed on four strategic goals that focused on member satisfaction, employees, reliability, and positive economic impact. The goals are enhance member-owned owner satisfaction while leveraging the cooperative business model, attract, maintain a safe, healthy, motivated, engaged, skilled, and healthy workforce, provide safe, reliable electric service to our members, and be a respected business partner and drive positive economic impact for our members and community. When I reflect on past strategic plans, these four themes are common. It goes to show that even though we are entering a new era in the electric utility industry, the principles remain the same. Serve the membership, employ good people, provide reliable service, and have a positive ec economic impact on those we serve. Serving the membership is why we exist. So member satisfaction is, key, is a key driver in why we do what we do and also me measure our success. Our goal is to enhance member own, owner satisfaction while leveraging the cooperative business model. Leveraging the cooperative business model means we focus on, focus on ensuring our members are engaged in the democratic process have economic participation in the form of equity through capital credits, are educated and informed about the cooperative, and are provided options that enable them to take full advantage of their membership and that we work for the sustainable development of communities that they live and work in. As I st stated, member satisfaction is not only a key driver in what we do, but also a measure of our success. Every two years, we partner with a third-party vendor to conduct a survey that, members, that measures member satisfaction using the American Customer Satisfaction Index. This chart on the screen shows our results going back to 2004. You can see our highest score was an 86 out of 100 in 2004, and our lowest score was an 80 in 2011. 
You may be thinking that with those scores, we're getting a solid B in customer service. However, if you compare our scores with electric utilities in general scoring 73.2, we're doing pretty well. Even when you compare us with the top industry scores in 2019, we scored higher. When compare, comparing to the large, large leaders in the energy sector, we outscored them, including XL Energy, by 15 points. Our staff's efforts to provide superior customer service and transparent communications are evident in these scores and the positive relationships we have with our members. We will be conducting this survey again in 2022 and ask if you receive an email or call that you take the time to participate in the survey to, to provide us with your valuable feedback. Our second goal of attracting and maintaining a safe, highly motivated, engaged, skilled, and healthy workforce is key to be, ab be able to best serve our membership. It is intentional that the word safe is listed first because in our industry, safety is critical. I'm proud of our organization's safety metrics. It's not to say that we don't have incidents of injury. This slide shows that the number of OSHA recordable incidents in the past six years. The goal is always zero, and as you can see, we've been above the average of 2.2 cases per 100 employees for the industry, utility industry. However, the severity rate of these incidents has been low. As a matter of fact, for the first five, past five years, it has been zero. Severity is measured by the number of days an employee is un unable to work uh, due to a related work injury. When compared to our counterparts with our insurance group, you can see our rate of zero is outperforming the higher performance, which is in indicated in the gold bar on the graph, followed by other cooperatives from the state in orange, the nation in blue, our region in purple, and cooperatives of similar size in green. The first set of bars on the left is for 2021, the set of bars in the middle is for the past three years, and the last set is for the previous six years. Why does this matter to members? First and foremost, because in many cases, our employees are neighbors, friends, and even family members of our membership, and no one wants those who we care about getting hurt. It also matters because it ends up saving cooperative members money through lower worker compensation insurance premiums. This slide shows for the past seven years, we have had an experience modifier below one, which means we have received a discounted premium on our insurance based on our employees' safe work practices. I personally want to thank our employees for their diligence in working safe and looking out for one another. Our purpose as an organization lies in the providing safe and re reliable electric service to our members. We do this through managing our local infrastructure and being actively engaged with our power suppliers. I'm not going to get into detail on this as Mike and Brent will talk more about these aspects of reliability, but I do want to point out how well we did in 2021. This chart is busy but it shows how reliable we were in 2021. As you can see that up until the December 15th severe weather event, we, we were performing at our goal of 99.98%. The red line shows actual availability, uh, availability which means of the 8,760 hours a year electricity was available 99.911% of the time, or all but eight hours on average for our members. If we factor out the December 15th event, electricity was available 99.991% of the time, which is basically all but one hour of the entire year. This is a testament to our investments in rebuilding portions of the system, as well as our maintenance and vegetation management programs. Thank you once again to our staff for
for being proactive in their efforts to ensure reliability and for restoring power to members in a timely manner. Being a respected business partner that drives positive economic impact for our members and community is important to us that, and aligns with the cooperative principle of concern for community. We recognize that as a utility, we have a unique opportunity to leverage our size, reach, and relationships to benefit the communities we serve. Examples of this include the scholarship program that provides one in $2,000 scholarships to graduating high school seniors whose parents or guardians are members of the cooperative. Our Operation Roundup program, which grants around $100,000 each year to local charities, schools, and communities and organizations, and, provides, and providing low interest loans for our revolving, from our revolving loan fund for gap financing to help local businesses. This also involves pursuing load growth opportunity because having the right load mix at the right times of the day impacts our power costs. It also includes having a strong financial plan that incorporates cost control measures. Both aspects are important because they help stabilize rates for all members, driving positive economic impact directly to our members. As you can see, our strategic goals align not, on, not only with the seven cooperative principles, but with our mission and our vision. President and CEO Mike Henke will now share highlights about the strate strategies that will help us achieve our strategic goals. As Mike comes to the podium, please remember that if you have a question, to enter it into the comment section of either Facebook or YouTube, and Mike and I will respond to them at the close of the meeting as time allows. Thank you, Jerry. Good evening. I hope you took the opportunity to read our message in the annual report about the highlights of our accomplishments in 2021. When combined with the financial successes that Tracy shared and our safety reliability stats that Jerry shared, you can see we had another good year despite living through a second year of a pandemic and, all, and all having a significant weather event in December. Creating a strategic plan is both exhilarating and daunting at the same time. Exhilarating because looking toward the future and setting goals is optimistic and hopeful. Daunting because determining strategies is challenging when opportunities are endless, yet resources like people, time, and money are not. As Jerry stated, our goals carry the same themes as past strategic plans. However, some of our strategies are different as we look to the future and navigate the changing landscape of the electric utility industry and society in general. In the interest of member education and transparency, I'm going to share the strategies for each of the goals. In the interest of time, I'm only going to talk at length about a few of them. Our first goal is to enhance member owner satisfaction while leveraging the cooperative business model, because without our members, we cease to exist. Our strategies to achieve this goal include be the trusted energy resource for our members, maintain competitive and equitable retail rates with member choice options, enhance member engagement to drive good governance and program participation, and ensure data security and data privacy. Being a trusted energy resource means different things to different members, including trusting the power will come on when it's needed, trusting that the power will be restored as quickly as possible when it goes out, trusting their rates are fair and reasonable, trusting us to live out our value of stewardship in the management of all resources entrusted to our care with sensitivity to the environment, trusting us to know about new technologies, and trusting us to secure personal information. We take all of this seriously and are driven to earn the trust of our members by meeting and even exceeding member expectations. As part of our member satisfaction survey in 2022, we will be asking members to share their expectations of a trusted energy resource so that we can develop plans to meet them. I will echo what Jerry said. If you receive a call or email asking to partic participate in the survey, please take the time to do so. 
maintaining competitive and equitable re retail rates with member options, member choice options, means that we continue to evaluate our rates to ensure they are fair, equitable, and support the fiscal health of the cooperative. One way we evaluate our rates is to conduct cost of service and rate studies with the help of a third party vendor. And another is to compare our rates to utilities to ensure we aren't an outlier. A recent comparison of bills for urban residential members shows we are in line with our neighbors, especially when you consider we have only eight members per mile of line compared to Rochester Public Utilities, 70 consumers per mile of line. Our eight members per mile of line generate an average of $16,000 in revenue per mile compared to RPU's 70 consumers per mile of line that generate over $200,000 of revenue per mile. This table shows what an urban residential consumer who uses an average of 760 kilowatt hours of electricity per month would pay on a monthly and annual basis at our neighboring utilities. In this example, they would pay $2.27 less per month at RPU which equates to about $27 a year. Investor-owned utilities like Excel Energy generally tend to have lower rates than cooperatives because they serve so many more consumers in a more densely populated area. When factoring in their surcharges, we are actually $1.74 lower per month than Excel Energy. Member choice options refers to rates we offer such as time of use rates that provide members a financial incentive if they follow guidelines on when they use or don't use electricity. Enhancing member, member engagement to drive good governance and program participation means meeting members where they are to ensure they're being heard, informed, and served. We know people's lives are busy and most tend not to think about the cooperative or their electric service unless they're paying their bill or the power is out. It is our intent to offer events and activities that provide for meaningful connections so members become more engaged with a cooperative. This is important because cooperatives are based on the idea that those who participate in an organization, the members, should also govern it. To effectively govern, one needs to be engaged. I'm thankful we have a board that is very actively engaged. Ensuring data security and privacy is critically important to members, employees, and the cooperative as a business. Especially today when so many people are trying to hack into people's personal information. We take this very seriously and train staff and the board on best practices and policies to avoid cybersecurity attacks. We participate in regular training to ensure that we're aware of potential threats, are using secure passwords, deleting malicious emails, and not clicking on links that could lead us down a path we don't want to go. The strategies to achieve our goal of attracting and maintaining a safe, highly motivated, engaged, skilled, and healthy workforce include creating a culture of positive engagement developing public-facing tactics to attract employees, implementing training programs to identify and develop expertise, promoting a healthy lifestyle, and evaluating our compensation plan to ensure it's competitive and motivates employees. Most of these are self-explanatory, but I do want to address the strategies about public-facing tactics to attract employees and our training programs. As you know, today's available workforce is smaller than it used to be. Long before the COVID pandemic, HR professionals in our industry were predicting a worker shortage as baby boomers retired. Those days are now upon us. We're fortunate that our turnover is low and retirements have been staggered. However, we're still experiencing workforce challenges with lower number of applicants when we do have job openings. Therefore, we're going to take a more proactive approach to attract employees, not only for today's demands, but tomorrow's as well. This is one of the reasons we visit schools with our safety display or present one of our programs about energy efficiency or power generation. 
It provides us the opportunity to plant the seed in the student's mind to work at an, elect at an electric utility someday. If you have a classroom or youth group and would like us to visit with them, please reach out to our member relations department by calling the office or emailing member relations at peoplesenergy.coop and they would be happy to set something up. Implementing training programs to identify and develop expertise refers to many facets. It includes expertise in software applications to enable us to be as efficient as, efficient as possible with the tools we have. It involves developing employees to understand and monitor market disruptors and emerging technologies like battery storage, electric vehicles, and the next generation of renewable energy. It also includes developing succession plans for key roles to ensure smooth transitions and growth opportunities for our staff. As an organization, we encourage employees to continue to learn, to learn and grow and support their efforts in doing so. A skilled and educated workforce is critical in our industry and is a key factor in our ability to provide customer service, superior customer service, and reliable electricity. Our strategies to provide safe and reliable electric service to our members are few and simple. They are to manage our local infrastructure and advocate for members' interest through strong engagement with our power suppliers. Managing local infrastructure involves maintaining the existing system, replacing aging infrastructure, and planning for consumer growth. While this sounds simple, it's not easy. There's a great deal of planning, designing, and physical work that goes into managing our distribution system. We have four-year construction work plans and 10-year long-range plans that include projects to build and maintain substations as well as replace miles of overhead and underground lines annually. This doesn't even account for the need to build new line for new members. With over a thousand square miles of service territory, the work is never done. Advocating for our members' interests through strong engagement with our power suppliers means active participation on the Dairyland Board of Directors by our representative, Art Frederick. It also involves me being an active participant in the Dairyland Managers Association and on my assigned committees. Other staff members are also actively serving on committees at Dairyland as well. All of this to ensure our members' interest, best interests are served. I've asked Brent Ridge, Dairyland's president and CEO, to talk about their energy transition plan and their bridge to renewable energy that ensures reliability. He'll be up in a minute to share that plan. Last but not least, our goal and vision to be a respected business partner and drive economic impact to our members and community will be achieved through strategies that pursue load growth opportunities, maintain and grow positive relationships with members, the communities in our region, legislators, and industry partners. Maintain a strong financial plan to ensure financial integrity and invest in technology for security and internal efficiency. I want to focus in on the pursuit of load growth opportunities. Traditionally, load growth goals have been linked to attracting new businesses or helping existing ones to expand. Today, electric vehicles are presenting an opportunity for load growth. Electric vehicle growth will help all members, regardless of whether they choose to adopt EV technology or not. This is because it spreads our power providers' costs over more kilowatt hours, which helps keep all rates more affordable. We estimate that if 5% of new vehicles purchased by households in our service territory were fully electric by 2025, that would represent a similar load to one of our largest industrial customers, equating to over 2 million kilowatt hours per year. While this growth can be fa will be fast and will provide much of the same benefits of a new large industrial account, it will also be distributed across our system and will need much smaller incremental improvements to our grid infrastructure as compared to a single factory. Additionally, because this increased power, will happen, power use will happen primarily at night, when demand on the grid is low, 
it will lead to more efficient use of our existing resources. The combination of additional power sales and more efficient use of resources, all at a pace that's well within our ability to improve our service infrastructure, will help to strengthen our long-term financial position as a cooperative and benefit all of our members. Currently, our service territory tracks very close to the national average for EV adoption, and 5% of sales by 2025 is on the conservative side of what forecasters estimate for national EV adoption. This is one of the reasons we have put effort into educating members about EV charging. We actively engage in relationships with community leaders, the legislators that re represent our membership, and, in and, and industry partners to leverage our ability to best serve our members. As a matter of fact, we were at the Capitol last week and met with five of the 16 legislators that represent members in our service territory. This year, one of our key legislative issues is related to the Minnesota Department of Revenue's overreach on property tax. They have reinterpreted a 1939 statute that grants electric cooperatives an exemption from personal property tax for attachments and appurtenances to a cooperative's distribution system outside of incorporated areas. These are things like meters and streetlights. Instead of paying property tax for these items, we currently pay a fee of $10 for each 100 members. The intent of this 80-year-old law is to keep costs low for rural electric providers since the revenue per mile of line is so low compared to more urban areas. In 2020, the Department of Revenue started to require a handful of cooperatives, including us, to start paying property tax on these items. We believe this is contrary to the long-standing law that has, that has 80 years of precedent setting evidence of the intent of the law. Senator Weber of Laverne is carrying the bill for Minnesota cooperatives in the Senate, and we're still waiting for a bill to be introduced in the House. We're very thankful for Senator Carlo Nelson's support of the bill by signing on as a, as a co-author. Senators Goggin and Senjum also indicated they will support the bill, which is Senate File 3898, if you'd like to follow bills through the legislative process. This bill is important to us because we were charged $200,000 in additional taxes, which roughly equates to an extra $10 per member annually. This is simply unacceptable, and we continue to push to resolve this issue on your behalf. Yesterday, I testified at a Senate tax subcommittee hearing in St. Paul about this very topic and how it affected our cooperative. We are pushing to get a bill going in the House, and we will update you on this issue in further newsletters. Maintaining a strong financial plan to ensure financial integrity for the cooperative entails ensuring that our rates are covering our fixed costs, and we are controlling the costs best we can, and that we are counting for needed equity for borrowing power. We are in the fourth year of our five-year rate restructure plan. The purpose of this plan is to merge the rates of our legacy and SMEC members and shift, costs, shift fixed costs into the fixed charge we refer to as our basic service charge. This helps ensure that volatile weather and energy markets won't have a dramatic impact on members' bills, and that the cooperative is only collecting what it needs to cover fixed costs and the cost of power along with a small margin. And finally, investing in technology for security and internal efficiency is, our key, to, is key to our success, since technology powers much of what we do day to day. As you know, technology is ever-changing and at an increasing pace. As I stated earlier, cybersecurity is also becoming more and more critical, and protecting our member information and employee information is of utmost importance. Look for updates on the progress of our strategic goals in future newsletters and other communication channels. Before I turn the mic over to Brent, I would like to recognize two employees who achieved milestone anniversaries in 2021. The first is crew lead Rich Kendall, who reached 25 years of service in March of last year. The other is Gary Sherhammer, who retired from his position as warehouse worker in June after 45 years of service. Gary was hired in February of 1976 as a work order clerk. 
He moved to the warehouse worker position in March of 1998, where he has served until his retirement. I will now turn the mic over to Brent Ridge, who is the president and CEO of Darlin Power Cooperative, our primary power provider. Brent? Well, thank you, Mike. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I want to make sure the mic's working fine. Can you hear me good? All right, excellent. So uh, meeting, uh, meeting with folks uh, at annual meetings is one of the best part of my job. I've been here for uh, 20 months at Darlin Power, and I've just had a pleasure talking about Darylin's future, the challenges that face us, but the solutions we also put forward. And so today I'll spend most of the time talking about how we're going to transition from really a, a more carbon intensive footprint to more renewables and how we're going to focus on reliability as we make that carbon transition. Uh, first off, though, I like to start meetings like this with a thank you and a gratitude. So first, thank you to all the members of Peoples. Uh, if you're a member of Peoples, you're a member of Dairyland, and we don't exist without you. I don't have a job without you, and just greatly appreciate uh, your participation and uh, the ownership that you take in our system. Of course, within, uh, within the system, we have our teammates, the teammates that Mike has talked about tonight, 45 years, fantastic. Uh, a run for that employee. We can't do anything without those teammates both at Dairyland and here at Peoples and all of our member co-ops. We have a Dairyland Managers Association that uh, provides uh, advice to me on a very regular basis on our major decisions and Mike Hinkie is a valued and a very engaged member of the Dairyland Managers Association. And then Art Frederick is a uh, is a engaged and a very, very beneficial member of the Dairyland Board of Directors, and we thank you for sending him our way. I've also had an opportunity to meet a couple of times with the People's Board, and uh, my experiences here have been engaging, effective, and just a great board to work with within our system. So thank you and appreciate all your support. So as, before I dive into the future and uh, where we're going with our portfolio, I want to focus a little bit on my goal. I have one goal from our board of directors, and that is sustainability. Uh, and I focus in four areas for sustainability. First and foremost, we have to provide safe, reliable, predictable delivery of electricity to our members. And, and we're going to talk today a lot about assets and asset reliability and how that plays into a reliable electrical system. Cost competitiveness, we're focused on lower costs, uh, increasing load and grow outside revenue. A lot of the same things that you see at, at the People's Co-op, you see at Dairyland as the uh, overall system. Key focus of my chat today will be the methodical reduction of our carbon output while not sacrificing reliability. And that's a critical component of today's discussion. And whenever, I ask, whenever I'm asked what business I'm in, I'm not in the utility business, I'm in the people business. If we didn't have the people uh, working on our teams, there's nothing we would get done without those folks. So I'll pivot into uh, headwinds and the trends in the industry. And to first talk about that, we need to look at the overall system that we live in. Uh, you see the United States here, and in the central part of the state, you see a system called MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. The energy we produce goes into MISO, comes out to all the customers, uh, which number in the millions. And uh, you'll see where we sit in the middle. The, the, you see the Dairyland Power Service Territory right there in the upper middle. But MISO covers from Canada to Louisiana. And uh, when you think about where does your power supply come from, Fundamentally, it comes from the MISO system. Everything we produce goes into the system as a whole and then comes out uh, as a system, and that's really where the carbon footprint relies or lies. So MISO looks at reliability challenges every year. And right now we see trends, you see them in the newspaper, uh, power plant retirements, coal plant closures. We closed a coal plant in June of 2021. That's happening throughout the MISO system and throughout the United States. These are baseload resources that produce power 24-7, whether the wind's blowing or the sun's shining. And as you close those, there becomes less and less uh, reliability. That wind and solar is not always available. And as natural gas resources become challenged for us sometimes in the winter, when it's most needed, natural gas is focused on residential heating, so it's not available for the power plants we have. And the bottom line of looking at what's going on in MISO right now with power plant closures, gas supply scarcity, and, uh, and renewables coming on and off with the sun and the wind, 
there's some concern that we're going to have high peaks both in the winter and the summer. And uh, that's part of the challenge that I'll talk about today and how we're addressing that, ensuring our part of MISO is safe, reliable, and cost effective. So MISO asked the question, how quick can we reduce carbon? And you can see where we were in 2020. So this is looking at that entire center of the United States. And the key number I want you to focus in on is the 67% of fossil fuel. So if we're looking to be carbon free by a certain date, we have to eliminate 67% of the power mix. So that's in 2020. What MISO says is possible if we achieve deep decarbonization, and that depends on the economics, political environment, technologies, and reliability, deep, tar deep decarbonization in 2040, we still have 31% fossil fuel. And so these are the folks that run that entire system in the center of the United States. They're saying with deep decarbonization, if everything falls our way, we can go from 67% fossil fuel to 31% fossil fuel. So keep that in mind as I talk about the next couple of slides. So let's talk real world. Let's talk what actually happened in the MISO system during a couple of days in the last year or so. So November 18th, 2020, mild day in November, high of 53, low of 34. Fossil fuel represented 57% of the output in the entire system. That was, that's what was keeping the lights on. Jump ahead to the polar vortex on February 15th of 2021. Fossil fuels made up of 77% of the output in the MISO system. So when you think about why a, a utility like Dairyland exists, why people exist, peoples exist, we have to build for these shoulder events. We have to build for that February 15th period. We have to have power plants, transmission, distribution systems, substations that are ready, that are ready to take on the high loads at the worst temperatures. And that's really why we exist. During the, the November 18th of the, of the world, it's, it's a fair, pretty simple day in the utility world. So think about on November 15, 2021, we had 77% of fossil fuels keeping our lights on, keeping the heat on. These were also the same days where Texas was going through blackouts. As I talk about a few more slides and we look at the options, just keep that 77% in the back of your mind. So if we achieve a zero carbon grid by 2035, You'll see that in the media. You'll see uh, um, our, uh, our elected officials talk about that. But what does that really mean? What does it mean to be a zero carbon grid by 2035? So if you look at this graph, you see a series of bars. So starting on the left, the blue bar represents all of the coal and natural gas resources of the United States, 2,582 terawatt hours. If those were to go away, what could you replace it with? it would require 19 times the current solar output of the United States. It would require seven times the wind output. And when you think about nuclear power, it is carbon free, or non-carbon emitting, it's 24 seven available. If we were to try to replace the current US coal and natural gas fleet with nuclear, it would require every single nuclear power plant on the face of the planet to replace that. And I came from a nuclear utility. If you're looking to build a nuclear power plant, you've got to be thinking out in terms of a decade plus. So this is just simply the math in front of us and what the obstacle is in front of us. But there are options and there's ways to do this in a methodical way. So we also think about wind as a potential option. How much wind would we need to solve the same problem? It literally would take the surface area of two Californias to provide enough wind to replace the current coal and natural gas fleet. Now, having said all that, what are we doing about it? I've sort of laid out the problem, the challenge, but I'm a, a solution person and Mike Hinkie's a solution person, so how do we get there? So our purpose at Dairyland is to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective electricity. So, we believe and I believe that it's absolutely critical that we produce less carbon. And Dairyland has been doing that over the years. This graph shows our 
total carbon output over time. You'll see a big dip in 2021. That, that shows the closure of one of our large coal plants. And then that the progression of reduction from today through 2030 is the addition of more and more renewables into the system, but doing so in a slow and, and cost-effective way. Our energy mix will transition for, to more renewables and less coal between 21 and 31. And how are we doing that? More renewables and more peaking gas plants. So from a renewable perspective, we have well over 100 megawatts of wind on the system already. We use renewable landfill gas for part of our system. And, and next year, we're bringing on a solar facility in Wisconsin that uh, peoples will benefit from that'll produce 149 megawatts of solar energy. When you think about it just in terms of energy output, not in terms of capacity, that will represent about half the output of the coal plant that we closed. Though, of course, the solar facility doesn't run 24-7 like the coal plant. The other way we're going to meet the challenge is we're going to retire a coal plant, which produces a lot of carbon, and we're going to replace it with a peaking gas plant, which we purchased last year with the support of our members. This is 503 megawatts of much lower output carbon than, than our coal plant. But what it does for us is when the wind dies down or the sun goes down, this plant can peak and fill that gap. And so that's why it's called the peaking resource. When renewables go away cyclically, this power plant's available to provide capacity to keep the lights on. We're also in the process with three partners of building the Manji Trail Energy Center. This is a combined cycle, clean gas plant that can eventually run on hydrogen. That's in the process uh, of planning and permitting right now. And uh, that'll be online sometime in the next four years, depending on permitting and other issues. And that's located in uh, Superior, Wisconsin. Long-term long, long, long -term perspective, we're thinking nuclear. Dairyland, for a number of years, operated a nuclear power plant in Wisconsin. Um, it's probably time to start thinking about that in the long term. And as I said earlier, uh, it's not a one-year plan or a two-year plan. A nuclear power plant's a decade-long plan, and so we made the decision to begin thinking about it. We made the announcement that we're exploring it with New Scale, which is one of the small modular technologies. Uh, in fact, it's the only one that's been licensed by the NRC currently. And uh, once we made that announcement, we've got a tremendous amount of interest from potential partners. And so for nuclear to work, you've got to share the risk, and we're going to take a very methodical approach to entering nuclear, just like we're going to take a methodical approach in reducing carbon while maintaining the safe, reliable delivery of electricity. So that segues into my close. Uh, bottom line for me is it's about safe, reliable, and cost-effective energy for the future. We do that with an all-the-above approach. We're going to be balanced and measured in how we reduce carbon. We recognize that investment is trending towards renewable energy. And on a previous slide, you saw that. We're building solar. We're involving wind. We're using landfill gas. And we're bringing on gas plants that can ramp up and down to match renewables. But we've got to ensure reliable electricity for you, for our members, for our owners, for our customers. And for us, it's an all-the-above approach, and that's going to be solar, wind, and hydro balanced by coal, nuclear, and gas with coal diminishing over time and gas and nuclear ramping up over time. So again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present, Mike. And uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to any questions we might have time for at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Thank you for being with us tonight. Before we introduce the candidates, the cooperative wants to thank the nominating committee for their service in nominating the slate of candidates. This group came together in mid-December to start pursuing candidates and made their nominations in late January. This year's nominating committee members from District 1 are pictured in the back row and are from left to right, Larry Plank and Ken Aker. And from District 6 in the front row, from left to right, are Joel Mesmer, Chuck Rathbun, and Tom Leonard. To introduce this year's candidates and announce the results of the election, please welcome our corporate attorney, Dan Burnt, from the law firm of Dunlap & Seeger. Thank you, Mike. Good evening. 
You received information about each of the board candidates in your ballot package as well as in the annual report. The candidates for the 2022 election are from District 1, John Craning and Pete Street. From District 6, Art Friedrich and Randy Brock. Thank you to these four people for stepping forward to run for a seat on the Board of Directors. Also on this year's ballot, you were asked to vote for two board, you were asked to vote for two board candidates and to approve amendments to the articles of the cooperative's bylaws. The, art, the, the directors elected today will serve for three years. The results for the directors in District 1 is John Craning, and in District 6 is Art Frederick. All of the amendments to the bylaws passed with over 90% approval. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this year's election process. At this time, I ask that John and Art join me to pledge an oath of office. Gentlemen, if you would raise your right hand. Having been duly elected as a member and director of People's Energy Cooperative, do you solemnly swear to perform the duties as directors of the cooperative to the best of your ability and in conformity to the Constitution, laws, and regulations of the United States of America and the state of Minnesota, as well as the Articles of Incorporation, bylaws, and policies of this cooperative? If so, please answer by saying I will. Thank you. You may be seated. Mr. Wooner. Thank you, Dan, and congratulations to the elected board members, and thank you to all the candidates who participated in this year's election and all the members who voted. As a reminder, uh, following the adjournment, we'll uh, reply to any questions that have been submitted, if we have any. Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to take a minute to recognize Joe Book for his service to the cooperative. Joe, can you please join me up here? Um, Joe did not seek re-election this year uh, for his seat for the People's Energy Cooperative uh, Board of Directors, a seat he has held since 2013. Joe, on behalf of the cooperative members, board of directors, staff, and staff, thank you for your commitment to the cooperative and your communities. We wish you well and hope you ha can spend more time with things you enjoy doing, um, spending more time at your cabin in Canada, and being with your family. Please accept this gift, Joe, from the cooperative. And uh, congratulations, and uh, hopefully this will remind you of all the fond times and all the hard work you've done for the cooperative and being on the board. We definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All those, uh, please give us a round of applause. For that. Uh, I'm proud to represent all the, all the members, and one of the things that I'll tell you right now, I just went to another class a week ago, and one of the things I found out is a cool thing, is that um, about a year ago, they shut down a, about two-thirds of all the oil wells in the United States, because the price of oil was below zero per barrel. So now at $100 plus per barrel, they were firing them all up, they started in November, and it takes about 10 oil wells a week. So by mid-July, and the economist says, we should have all the oil we want, but, and propane and everything else, but the price is set by the market. So uh, there should be no shortages at all. So that's one of those things I find out at that at, at, at meeting. And uh, thank you very much for uh, 
calling me and, and the people that volunteered on, on my uh, on different committees. I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, almost done with the meeting here. Is there any unfinished business? Is there any new business? There being no further business, I would entertain a motion and a second to adjourn the meeting. Also moved. Got a motion, need a second? Second. Got a second. Motion, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries. The meeting is officially adjourned. Um, not sure if we have any questions. Um, we got one question that we will uh, answer. I'm assuming Mike's got it. Yeah, we actually had two from a guy named Curtis out in the crowd. So he's active on social media. So thank you, Curtis, for the for the questions. His first question was, any thoughts on building new nuclear plants? And that was before um, Brent's slide came up. So um, Brent answered that question on the fly organically. So um, the second question Curtis asked was, uh, how would you make up generation, generation capacity if a tornado or hailstorm would hit one of these big solar arrays? And we don't have anything big enough that would affect our uh, um, capacity um, here, but Daryl in May. So, Brent, can you offer, uh, I'll defer to you to answer the question, and that way I don't have to answer it. <laughs> because I can't. <laughs> you need the question again? Nope, I'm happy to answer it. I'm, that's what I'm here for. That's what you pay me to do. So, so in, in Daryl, we, we actually uh, don't have any solar that large either, and there's very few that would create a challenge that would uh, not be able to be absorbed in the MISO system. So when I talked about the MISO system, you remember that map and it's 900,000 square miles. We represent about 5% of that area. So there's 6,500 generating plants. A tornado is going to be fairly localized. It will impact uh, some generating facilities and some transmission and some distribution. In the case of a tornado, uh, the challenge will be the replacement of the transmission and the distribution lines that are fixed, not the ability to get power to the system, particularly related to solar or wind. That's one of the beauties of MISO and why we like being members of MISO. They make sure all the power is supplied in the places we need it. Mike and I, I worry about the transmission and substations. He worries about the distribution and substations. So the system's very resilient uh, against tornadoes from a power supply perspective. The delivery side, distribution and transmission, that's a different story. And that's why we work every day to be prepared for storms. Thank you, Brett. You betcha. I okay, appreciate it. <laughs> And again, thank you to Curtis for being active out there on social media. Do we have any other questions that came in on social media? Anybody? Go ahead. Okay. No more questions. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to uh, watch the meeting online this evening. We truly appreciate your interest in the cooperative and hope that we can all meet again in person next year. Thank you and good night. <laughs>